Steve and Angie, thank you. That was beautiful. Um, I'm always blessed by the worship here at Jesus Community Church. God has gifted us with some amazing worship leaders. Uh, but as we were singing, I was, I was kind of praying and, and meditating on the word and, and just being in God's presence. And I felt like God wants to say that, you know, there's some of you are caught in your sin. You're stuck. And you feel like you can't get out. And uh, Whether it's a, a sin that you committed a long time ago and you just haven't been able to get past it or it's something that you just face day after day and you have no victory over it. I want to share a couple things with you from God's Word. Okay? The first thing, you know, the, the first memory verse that they ever teach in, in church to all the little kids is John 3.16. And there's a couple principles in that little passage that, that are awesome. For God so loved the world, that means all of his creation, that he sent his one and only son, okay, that whoever believed in him, okay, see, see what is our responsibility is believing, okay? We, we choose to accept that what he said is so. That's faith. We, we choose to believe that. They would not perish, but they would have everlasting life. But we don't really follow to the next verse very often. For Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. Okay, so I want to start from there. We see that from Genesis to Revelation, God has been working on a plan for the salvation of man. Okay, Revelation tells us that the lamb was slain from before the foundation of the world. That goes hand in glove with God being omniscient. He knows everything. Before he spoke a word of anything into existence, God knew what it was going to cost. And the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit had already determined on a course of action. They knew that whatever that fruit was in the garden, they knew that Adam and Eve were not going to resist it. They were going to, they were going to cave. And they knew that sin would come in, and they knew that mankind needed a way to be taken out of that sin. And so there was a plan put in place. Uh, you can look through all the prophecies. You just look at the lineage of Jesus, how prophecies were given forth, that from Abraham, that from Isaac, that from Jacob, that from Judah, uh, all the way down, that, that a Messiah would come forth, the, the anointed one that would save. Now, in the, the Old Testament, they're looking forward to this salvation with anticipation. Uh, after the New Testament, we look back on something that has been accomplished, but we also look forward to the fulfillment of that, the, the finishing of God's work. Um, what I want to stress to you this morning is we like to put a lot of complications into salvation and, and the walk of Christ. And, and there are a lot of things that we need to be aware of. Scripture says that we are to be as shrewd as serpents and as innocent as doves. Okay? Well, this is a thinking faith. It's not something that is without merit. It's not saying, oh gosh, I hope it's like this. It's being assured that it is because he said it is. Okay? But when you come to salvation, when you come to that moment of faith where you surrender yourself to God, to Christ at the cross, and you give up your rights to yourself, your sin is done away with. It's paid for. It's covered. All of it. If it were not all of it, Jesus would have to be sacrificed over and over and over and over again, and it would never end. But Scripture tells us in Hebrews that his sacrifice was once and for all. Okay, that's the salvation that we have. Now, here's the, the flip side of this coin, is that we have an enemy who despises us. Okay? He's known as the deceiver, and he's known as the accuser. He wants to speak lies to us to get us off track that we won't understand, that we won't know the truth, that we won't live in the truth. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of us can accept the truth here. Well, yeah, okay, yeah, I accept it here, but it, it doesn't really work down into here. Well, I know that's true for them, but I'm not altogether certain it's true for me. I mean, I can look at other people's sin and go, oh yeah, God can forgive you that, heck yeah. But I struggle with my own sin. God will never forgive me of this. I did it again. I blew it. 
But Hebrews tells us that it was done once and for all, that all sin was covered. So with this enemy, who is known as the prince of the power of the air of this world, we also have a second enemy, and that's the world, the, the, the environment, the culture that we live in that is working very hard to deceive us, to pull us away, to keep us distracted, to keep us busy so that we won't become all that God has desired us to be. Okay? And then, as if that weren't enough, you know, having this, this fallen angel and him having control of this world and, and all this, the garbage that we hear and that we see, uh, we also have one other enemy, and that's our flesh. That's, that's that part of us that, that does things by rote, that we've done it, we've always done it this way, and we tend to fall back into those habits, learned behaviors that we, we just can't seem to break free from. And so there's this constant battle that goes on. Now... One of the things I, I want to address to you is that Jesus didn't come just to forgive us our sins, but he came that we might have victory. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that we wouldn't be caught by any of those snares, but we would be set free. Whom the Son has set free is free, mm -hmm. not just in the moment, but they're free indeed. So, one of the things the enemy likes to do, Satan, the devil, the deceiver, the accuser, is he likes to pin you down with your sin. He likes to heap that condemnation on you. He likes to get your thinking such that you're caught up and you can't live in the freedom that has already been given you. Okay? He wants you tied down. He wants you to be ineffective. He wants you to live under condemnation because that's what he lives under. You know, Scripture says Jesus came not into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. Well, the world is already condemned. He didn't need to condemn it. That happened in the garden. Okay? And so the world is already condemned. He came to make a way out from under that condemnation. We come to Christ, and, and a lot of times we come in a very emotional moment. Um, you know, what, what oftentimes I, I call the church camp salvation. You know, all the kids come together at church camp, and, and there's something that happens, and, and there's a very emotional atmosphere, and, and kids come to salvation because all of their friends are coming to salvation. Mm -hmm. And they have an emotional moment, and they, they come to the, 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 the door of heaven, and then they come back home, and all the adults, having gone through that when they were kids, are like, yeah, it's okay, it'll wear off. <laughs> and that, I think that's heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think when they come in and they bring excitement in, mm -hmm. instead of trying to tone down that excitement, we should participate in it. Yeah. But... What ends up happening is we don't live in the fullness of the faith that he's given us. We don't live in the fullness of the truth that he's given us. Because scripture says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. How do you get in Christ Jesus? Well, John 3.16, you believe. Ephesians 2. It's by his grace and faith that salvation Look, not, there's not a one of us that can ever be good enough to impress God. Okay? The standard of our measure is not each other. I can't look, you know, we, we do this, we all do this. We all tend to stand someone up next to ourselves and measure with that person. Okay? And, and if we're really devious about it, we, we pull somebody up next to us that's not nearly as good as we are. <laughs> so that, you know, we can... <laughs> You know, we can measure and feel good about ourselves. But Scripture doesn't say that we're to measure ourselves against each other. It says we're to measure ourselves against Christ. That's the only measure that has any difference. And that's why no one can come to salvation apart from grace, apart, apart from the cross, apart from separating and, and surrendering yourself to Him. But when you come, when you have faith, if you have confessed Jesus Christ as Lord, as Savior, and, and believed that He is Lord, you're saved. Okay? Now, there are other things that come as part of the lifestyle, living out that faith. But the enemy, the deceiver, wants to come in and go, Hey, Glenn, that's sin number 672 this week. And, you know, Jesus only said 77 times. <laughs> no, 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 no. He said 70 times 7. So, well, that's only 490 times. And so you've kind of crossed the threshold. 
and, and he wants to deceive us into thinking that in some way we can exhaust God's grace. Mm -hmm. that, that some way we can run his grace dry. But Paul says that, that where sin abounds, grace does also much more abound. <clears throat> you, you know, we, the devil likes to look at you and tell you your sin is, I mean, you know, some of us, we look at our sin and it's like, Jesus Christ, my, my sin could fill Lake Como. Others look and think, my sin could fill the salt lake. Some of us look at ourselves and say, uh, <laughs> the Pacific Ocean, baby. But his grace always exceeds our sin. And when you come to him in faith, God doesn't go through the list and say, well, this one's forgiven, but this one we're going to have to talk about. You know, this one, I, I, you've yet to prove me that you really deserve forgiveness for this sin. It's all taken care of. And so I want to just share with you, if you are caught today, if there is sin in your life, if the enemy is coming against you and he's saying you're never going to get victory over this, he's a liar. Mm -hmm. He's a liar. And if there is a sin in your past that, that he just keeps coming back and he says you're never going to be forgiven, you're never going to be forgiven, you're never going to be forgiven. Now, yeah, the enemy will never forgive us. The world may not forgive us, and, and quite honestly, the one that we have the most difficult time getting forgiveness from is ourself. Okay, because we believe the lies and we go, yeah, I, I, you're right. I'm, I'm scum, I'm worthless. But that's not what God says. What God says is that that sin is completely removed. He is, it says that he who knew no sin became sin, that he took our sin, that we might become the very righteousness of God. Now think about that for a minute. When the enemy comes against you as the accuser and he starts to come out with all of these things that you've done wrong. Is he lying? No, a lot of times he's not lying. He's, he's just telling it the way that it is. But we have an intercessor. We have a mediator. We have someone that stands in the gap on our behalf and says, no, Father, for this one I died. For this one, I, I, I took those sins. Those, those were given to my account. Those were put at my feet. And so this one, this one is righteous not because they deserve it, it's unmerited, but because he has given it. So I just want to encourage you today, if the enemy comes against you and he tells you lies and he wants to bind you up, he wants to keep you stuck, you stand firm on what we know to be true, the word of God, and the word of God says, no, my sins are forgiven. He has given me grace, he has given me mercy, he's giving me that which I do not deserve, he has taken away from me that which I was, and he created me anew. All right, so just to, just to encourage you today, stand in the truth. Live in that truth. Reject the lies of the enemy. Reject the lies of the world. Reject the lies that you tell yourself, and exist in the truth that this is. Okay? All right, so there, that's a little mini sermonette for free. Um, Open your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 23. We are working through <clears throat> the feasts. <clears throat> the feasts that God has given Israel. And we are down to the wire. <clears throat> You guys heard that, right? Yes. Well, I'm with you that heard it. Um, so we are working through the feasts. We've covered the spring feasts. Uh, we started off with the Sabbath. We covered Pesach or, or, or Passover. We've covered uh, Yom HaVikarim, the, the Feast of First Fruits. We've covered uh, Pentecost or Shavuot, the uh, Feast of Weeks. Uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We've covered the Feast of Trumpets. Um, you know, we had the spring feasts that we believe were all fulfilled in the coming of Jesus Christ and the establishment of the church. We see that in the Gospels and in the Book of Acts. Uh, and then we have this intermediary period that what is the summer period over in Israel. They, they brought in the spring harvest and then they're waiting on the fall harvest. And I believe that's the age that we're in, the, the dispensation of grace, the age of the church. Okay, because the last thing that the spring feast did uh, was Shavuot, 
Pentecost, and that was the birth of the church. Okay? And we're in the church age right now. I believe at the Feast of Trumpets, when that trumpet blows, that the church will be raptured, the bride of Christ will be taken up and taken out of the way, and then God's attention will return back to the Jews. Okay? Now, if we look at the feasts, we see that the while, while all of the feasts are by extension prophetic to us, they almost all deal specifically with the Jews first. Okay? God gave them the Passover as they, he delivered them out of Egypt. Okay? He gave them the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. <laughs> uh, wow. Now I'm hearing bells. Um, and then he gave them uh, the Feast of First Fruits. Now by extension, we're, we're inheritors, Gentiles, believers, are inheritors of those, but they were given first to the Jews. Okay? And then with the birth of the church, uh, it wasn't very long after the second chapter of Acts that, that God started doing some crazy and mysterious things. He started saving Gentiles in the same manner that the Jews were saved. And the Jews are kind of going, huh. Well, they don't have the law, they don't have the prophets, but they have everything that we had. Hmm. And so there was a, a council, and, and, and they sat down and they discussed the things that Peter saw and the things that Paul and Barnabas saw, and they said, wow, how can we deny that salvation has come to the Gentiles? And so we see the birth of the church, and immediately it, it, it overwhelms and expands beyond the Jews. Okay? Well, then we see the Feast of Trumpets, and, and, and the trumpet will be blown, the, the church will be raptured, and then God will turn his attention back to Israel, and I believe that's what Yom Kippur is, the, the, the um, uh, Feast of Atonement. Um, I believe that God is going to make atonement and fulfill the promises that he has given Israel that have not yet been fulfilled. I do not subscribe to the replacement theology, I don't believe that when uh, the church was born, God took all the promises that he had given to Israel. He took them away and he put them on the church. Uh, I think Paul makes that very clear in Romans 9, 10, and 11. Uh, I think there's no way that God's going to abandon them because he is faithful even when we are not, when we're faithless. Okay, so I believe their atonement will come at the Feast of Atonement, and, and then the Jews will be saved. And remember, it's going to be a remnant. It's going to be a, a part of a part that will be saved. And then we come to the Feast of Tabernacles. And, and we spent a bit of time a couple weeks ago just kind of going over the, the intro to the Feast of Tabernacles. Um, there's some passages that I want to go over with you today. Um, you'll see up on the overhead, uh, we're halfway through the Scriptures, We've already covered Leviticus 23, uh, both sections. We've covered Exodus, Numbers. We're in Deuteronomy today. But I want to read uh, Leviticus 23 because that's, that's the core passage that we have been working out of. So just so everybody's on the same page, uh, we're going to pick up in verse 26 of chapter 23. And then everybody will kind of understand where we're starting from. Okay, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, now on the tenth day of this seventh month is the day... Sorry, I'm on the wrong feast. I'm going to turn the page and get to the one we're working on. 33. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, On the fifteenth day of this seventh month, and for seven days is the Feast of Booths to the Lord. Some of your Bibles might say the Feast of Tents or the Feast of Tabernacles. Does anybody have anything different besides booths, tents, or tabernacles? Shelters. Shelters, okay. Mm -hmm. um, so keep, keep in mind, the whole idea of this is something temporary, okay? Um, verse 35, On the first day shall be a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. Now we've talked about a holy convocation. It's a set-apart gathering, okay? That's us. Okay, but speaking here, he's speaking to the people of Israel. This is a holy convocation. It's a, it's a set-apart gathering. All right? And present a food offering to the Lord. It is a solemn assembly. You shall not do any ordinary work. <clears throat> Verse 37. 
we have kind of this parenthetical statement stuck in here. We'll read over it and then come right back to the Feast of, of uh, the Tabernacles. These are the appointed feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim as times of holy convocation for presenting to the Lord food offerings, burnt offerings, and grain offerings, sacrifices and drink offerings, each on its proper day. Besides the Lord's Sabbath, and besides your gifts, and besides all your vow offerings, and besides all your free will offerings, which you give to the Lord. Now there's this, this statement stuck in here, um, because the Jews being human, they, they very easily look at this and say, okay, well, he's required all these sacrifices on this day, that, may, that exempts us from all the other ones. And God is saying, no, this doesn't exempt you. This is in addition to. Okay, so this, this parenthetical statement, and we'll see it repeated several times in, in relation to the feast. God is saying, no, these, these sacrifices that I'm giving you are going to be in addition to what you do daily, both as a nation and personal. Okay, so then in 39, he jumps right back to the tabernacles. He says, on the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the produce of the land, you shall celebrate the feast of the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a solemn rest, and on the eighth day shall be a solemn rest. And you shall take on the first day the fruit of splendid trees, branches of palm trees, and boughs of leafy trees, and willow of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. You shall celebrate you shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year. It is a statute forever throughout your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All native Israelites shall dwell in booths, that your generations may know that I made the people of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. And then there's this little statement at the end. Thus Moses declared to the people of Israel the appointed feasts of God. Now, going back through this passage, we see in each section, it starts off by saying, and the Lord spoke to Moses, say, and then he tells him, say this. Now, what's, what's interesting about that last verse, there is nothing in scripture that is here without purpose. Okay, sometimes the purpose may be uh, invisible to us. We may not understand it. We may not grasp it in the moment. But but there is nothing in here without purpose. And I think that verse at the end is simply a statement of Moses' obedience. Okay, and it says, "Thus Moses declared to the people of Israel the appointed feast of God." Because every feast, God said, "Okay, this is what I want you to say to the Israelites. This is what I want you to tell them." And Moses did it. He followed through. Now, um, one thing that I want to back up here. Um, verse 39 uh, says on the 15th day of the seventh month uh, when you have gathered in the produce of the land you shall celebrate the feast of the Lord seven days on the first day shall be a solemn rest and on the eighth day shall be a solemn rest you notice there's another day stuck in there because if you start on the 15th and you go seven days but then there's another added eighth day that, that's appended to this feast. Now, the Jews will refer to the eighth day as part of the feast, but they actually have a, a separate name for that day because really it's a feast unto its own. It's a day of solemn rest, a holy convocation. No regular, no ordinary work is to be done. Okay? One other thing that I want to point out to you real quick before we get into some of these other passages. Um, in verse 40... It talks about the different kinds of trees and branches, the fruit that he wants them to bring. But then at the very end it says, And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. <clears throat> I don't do well with orders. I don't like being bossed around. But God is telling them, to rejoice. As a matter of fact, in several of the passages, uh, he says, you shall celebrate with joy. Now, this is the only feast that we see that is, is given in this direction. We see the first fruits uh, and the latter first fruits. Uh, those were days that they celebrated the gathering in of the spring harvest, and, and that would be the barley, and then later the, the wheat. Uh, and then we have this period of summer, and we see uh, this feast is also called the uh, Feast of Ingathering. 
Um, that's one of the names that the Jews have for it because they would gather in the summer produce. And, and they're, why is God telling them to celebrate? Because they're looking at what God has given them. And they're looking forward to, with expectation, to what he will continue to give them. They were an agrarian-based society. They depended on the fruits of the field and the trees for their very survival. And, in measure, their prosperity. Okay? So, God tells them to rejoice. And every time I read that passage, I think of um, a friend of mine when I was growing up. His name was Dean. Um, his mom and dad had come to our church. Dean was about 14 years old. And Dean was tended to be a pretty reclusive guy. He tended to be kind of introspective. And he was not, um, uh, he, he was not one that would put himself forward in a crowd. And G Dean was much more comfortable staying at home, watching his TV and, and doing his routine than he was starting new things. And his dad had been after him, you know, I, I think you'd really like the youth group. And, uh, you know, Dean would come to Sunday school and, and, you know, hang out with us at Sunday school. And then after church, he'd hang out with us and then he'd leave and go. But he never came to youth group. Well, the youth group was having, uh, I don't even remember what it was. It was a get-together of some sort. And um, we'd been talking about it for weeks. We're getting together with a couple other youth groups. And uh, Dean's dad, Steve, told him, I, I really want you to go to this. And Dean was, no, I don't want to go. I don't, I don't want to. There's going to be people and people, and I don't want to go. Well, the day of the, the get-together came, and Dean just, he was not going to move. And Steve finally got upset with him, and he said, Dean, you are going to this youth group event. And furthermore, you will have fun. <laughs> now, Dean came to the event, and, and uh, Dean was actually ended up being really good friends with my brother Todd, who's a, a year older than I am. And, and of his own volition, after this event, he came to youth group, and he became knitted in with the, the core body of youth at, at that church. But it was I, I, that thought always stuck with me. How would I obey my dad if he told me to go and have fun? I, I don't know. Fun doesn't really register a lot with me. I don't do a lot of things for fun. Um, I told you about my visit to the doctor, and, and he asked me. There's very few times that people ask me things that my brain goes completely blank. There's two times that I can recall that my brain went completely blank. And this time, was I sat down and we're getting ready to talk about my exam and, and my, my diabetes and all of that. And, and uh, he goes, uh, so what do you do for fun? I looked over at Christy, and she, she, Christy's such a help in the doctor's office, she's like, I'm out of this. <laughs> I'm not getting involved in this. And, and uh, after what seemed like an eternity of having no thoughts in my head at all, the doctor said, okay, I can see where, where we're having a problem here. <laughs> I want you to start having fun. I want you to start doing things. And I'm thinking, what do I know? I, I, I don't, what do I do for fun? I don't know what I do for fun. There are things that I prefer to do rather than things that I don't prefer to do, but I don't know that I ever pursue fun. So, pray for your pastor, because I have been under the doctor's orders to find out what would be fun, and then I'm supposed to do it. <laughs> I'm thinking bungee jumping. <laughs> Steve, I'll go if you'll go. <laughs> Shoot. Okay, so... All of that to say that this celebration, God is telling them, you will rejoice. You will have joy. Okay? So let's get into these other passages. I'm not going to read them because there's quite a few of them. I'm just going to kind of hit some highlights. Deuteronomy 16, 13 through 16. Okay? Um, <clears throat> Couple things, couple uh, 16, verses 13 through 16. Couple things that I just want to draw out from this passage. One, it was a mandatory feast. 
Uh, this is one of the Shalosh Regalim, which is the three feasts that God requires that all the Jewish males of age go to ultimately Jerusalem, but when they, when they were first in the land of Israel, he told them to go to the place where he dwelt, and that would have been Shiloh. Okay, So they would all, three times a year, they would all come together for these specific feasts. Okay, So he's telling them, this is a feast that you've got to come. All right? This is the only fall feast that he requires them to come to. Uh, second thing, um, he tells them rejoice. And he doesn't see, in this one it talks about the Israelites rejoicing. In, in Deuteronomy, he's telling them, um, everybody rejoice. Men, rejoice. Women, rejoice. Children, rejoice. Foreigners in the land, sojourners, rejoice. Hey, look, if you're in Israel at the time of this feast and you're breathing, rejoice. Have joy. Take joy in what's going on because you are celebrating. This is the end of the gathering for the year. This is the last. The harvest is done. Everything has been brought in. Now you celebrate. Okay? And, and then we're also going to see it wasn't just looking back on what God had done the previous year. It's also a time of celebration looking forward in faith to what God is going to do the following year. Where, not just where he's taking you from, but where he's going to take you to. Okay? So, uh, next point. Um, it was to be celebrated in the place of the Lord's choosing. Uh, first, that was at Shiloh. Um, awesome, awesome time when we were in Israel. We got to go up to um, Shiloh and where they believed that the tabernacle was set for quite some time, from the time Joshua came into the land until King David brought it uh, up to it. Well, actually, that's not true. Uh, when the sons of Eli took it out and the Philistines captured it, then it was brought back and it was kind of set in a place for a time because they didn't know what to do with it. Uh, I, I personally, I believe the reason that it was set there in that time is because when the Philistines defeated the Israelites and they took the Ark of the Covenant, I think it was shortly thereafter that the Philistines wiped out Shiloh. So the, the place, the tabernacle, was gone. Okay? Um, but the Ark sat at, at <laughs> this farmer's house. And then David brought it up, and we remember the story of David, and, and the gentleman reached up to touch it to keep it from spilling over, and he was struck dead, and David's like, oh, no, what did we do? Well, you know, sometimes ignorance is not an excuse, especially when you should know what the Word says. And, and God had made it very clear in the writings of Moses that they were to carry it, and it was only to be done by the Levites, and nobody was supposed to touch the ark. And the... David should have known that. The priest should have known that. The people should have known that. But they didn't listen, did they? And, and so the ark was set for a time to the side until Gabe, David could inquire and figure out what needed to be done. And then they did it properly, and he brought it into the city of David, and David danced like a maniac. Okay? Picture Kevin Bacon in Footloose. All right? David was dancing like a nut. And he said, I will become even more undignified than this. I love that, the heart and the thought of that. Um, you know, and, and poor Michael, who was so offended for the dignity of the king, she was actually stricken barren because she was more concerned about David than she was about God, and, and that the ark was coming into the, the city of David. So um, first we see that God called him three times a year to Shiloh, and then later, three times a year, it was going to be up to Jerusalem. Okay? So, um, <clears throat> they were not, uh, oh, I'm sorry, they were to rejoice because God blessed their increase. As a matter of fact, some of what they were given with their props and their, they were to gather and bring to, to Jerusalem. And they were to bring it to celebrate. Hey, look what God has given me. God has blessed us abundantly. So they have cause for rejoicing because they have uh, the stuff that God has given them, the, the crops that God has given them. Um, they were not to come before God empty-handed, but each was to bring as God had blessed. Okay, so if you have a small farm, you're not going to bring as much as somebody that had a big farm. Okay, but you are still required to bring as God has blessed you. Okay, 
I, I correlate that to the New Testament when Jesus was sitting at the temple and he was watching the people come and put their offerings in the box. And, and he watched and, and the widow came and she put in her two mites. Okay, now a mite is the smallest coin that Israel had. Okay, there was no, I mean, it's like a penny. And, and he put it in and he turned to the disciples and he said, I'll tell you the truth, this woman has given more than all these others. And, you know, the, they got to be sitting there thinking, the, the guy right before her gave 10 times that amount or 20 times that amount or 100 times that amount. How can she have given more? Well, Jesus clarified because the disciples are just like us. They were dense. Okay? And it took the word of God to open their minds. It took the spirit of God to get them to the place of understanding. So he tells, I, I tell you the truth, she gave everything that she had. They gave out of their prosperity. It's easy to give when you have a lot. But man, when you don't have a lot, it is really tough. When you're sitting down and you're looking over your bank account and you've got X amount of dollars and you know if you give to God first that X amount of dollars isn't going to cover all the bills that have to be paid, you've got to give out of your need. See, God challenges us in that, in, in Malachi, that when we bring our tithes, that it's not a matter of just blind obedience because, you know, you don't know any better. He challenges us and he says, test me in this and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven. Okay, that's the only time God ever says challenge me in this. Okay, so, so I look at this, you know, when, when we bring our gift, again, we're not setting our measure against the people before or after us. We're not looking to those around us. You know, I bring my two bags of grain and I'm standing beside Benjamin and he's got ten bags of grain. So I'm looking around for which one of you guys only has one bag of green so I can stand next to you. Okay? Um, so it's not a matter of comparing to each other. It's a matter of acknowledging the blessing that God has given them. Okay? So let's, let's jump forward to the next passage. Um, this will be Deuteronomy chapter 31, um, verses 9 through 13. <coughs> Now keep in mind, all of these passages that we have looked at are in the, the books of the law, the Torah, the writings of Moses. These are all writings. Uh, each time that he refers back to the Feast of Booths, you know, if God repeats something, it's important. Now everything in the Word of God is important, but when he repeats something, you really need to pay attention. When he repeats it four or five or six times, you really got to pay attention to what's going on. Okay, so in this passage, um, Moses is, it's at the end of Moses' life, and he writes out the law, everything that God has given him, and he gives it to the Levites, and he puts it in their care. Um, he makes a couple of interesting comments. First, every seventh year at the Feast of Tabernacles, okay, so every seventh year at the Feast of Tabernacles, Moses says, uh, via God, uh, that any Jews that had been enslaved in the intervening years by the other Jews, you, your, your, your crops failed or you had hardship co come upon you, you could choose to voluntarily enslave yourself to another Jew's care, another Israelite's care, and, and you would work for them and they would take care of you. Okay? Every seven years at the Feast of Tabernacles, that was the mark to set those slaves free. They were to be set free. They were to be returned to their freedom. Okay. Now, um, we also see that every 50th year, the, the, the year of Jubilee, the land was returned and everything was set back to the right order that God had established for them. But every seven years, you know, you run, run up on a, on a bad year. It can really mess you up. You run up on two or three bad years and you're in trouble. Okay. God put a system in place for them to be cared for by their brothers and sisters, their fellow countrymen, for the duration such that they could get past that hump and then be returned to freedom. Okay. Now, we know from examples in scriptures that some of the Jews did it right, some of the Jews did not do it right. As a matter of fact, um, some of the Jews, when they came back from exile, they were enslaving their brothers and sisters. And, and uh, 
Nehemiah and Ezra confronted him and said, you know, what are you doing? This is not what God has called us to set them free. And they said, oh, yeah, you're right, of course. You know, God, yeah, we got to set them free. And then they turned around and went and enslaved him again, and, and Nehemiah got pretty hot about it, okay? So keep in mind, God's intentions are not always what happened. And people like to judge Scripture based on how man handled Scripture. And that's completely backwards, okay? We're to judge man by Scripture because Scripture is the perfect law. That's, that's the way it's supposed to work, not the other way around, okay? So they were to be set free every seventh Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, all of the women, men, children, and sojourners uh, were to be gathered every seventh year to hear the reading of the law, okay? Every seventh year. They were to come together, and they were to hear what God had told Israel to do. And this is significant because every seven years, anybody that was born in that intervening time and anybody that moved into the land in that intervening time were able to hear what God expected of them. Okay? This is, this is huge because the, the, the priesthood was in a specific spot. And so when they called all the men up at Shalosh Regalim to come, every seventh time, the women and children had to come with them. And everybody got to hear what God spoke through Moses. Okay? So keep these things in mind because as we get into some of the customs that came out of this, uh, we're going to see exactly how that played out. And like I said, there's nothing in here on accident. When we get into the New Testament, I'm hoping you guys will have your eyes open to some of the things that Jesus said and did, uh, especially in the book of John, at the Feast of Tabernacles. Okay, so um, one more thing real quick. Um, no, I'm not, I'm not even going to do that. Uh, there's several passages in the writings in Kings and Chronicles, Ezra and Nehemiah, that talk about um, the Feast of Tabernacles. I'll give you a little teaser. Um, when Solomon dedicated the temple, that was during the Feast of Tabernacles. They started a week before in celebration for the, the building of the temple. And they went from that seven-day celebration right into the celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles. And, and we'll see that in some of the other writings. And as it was drawn out uh, for that second week, and then, and then on the eighth day, they rested. They partied for two weeks. And then they rested. And, and we'll, we'll kind of get into a little bit of that, but I really want to get into uh, some of the customs and traditions as to how this was to be celebrated by the Jews. And then we're going to take that whole framework and we're going to lay it over the New Testament scriptures so you can see that the New Testament is solidly built on the firm foundation of the Hebrew Bible of the Old Testament. Okay? So we're, hopefully we're going to be connecting dots. It's meat and potatoes right now. Okay? But when we take those meat and potatoes and we put them in the framework of the New Testament, man, it's a seven-course meal. Okay?